In the course of his preaching, John the Baptist said, Someone is following me, someone who is more powerful than I am, and I am not fit to kneel down and undo the strap of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. It was at this time that Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized in the Jordan by John. No sooner had he come up out of the water than he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit, like a dove, descending on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, my Beloved, my favour rests on you. Today is the feast of the baptism of our Lord, which is the last day of Christmas tide. Tomorrow on Monday we begin the, with the, in the first week of ordinary time. And so our Christmas period begins with the birth of our Lord and ends when he begins his ministry. And his ministry properly begins with the baptism followed by the 40 days and the desert after which he begins his time of preaching the kingdom of God. So today's feast, in fact, is very significant, but I want to reflect upon today's feast from the perspective of our Lord, because today's feast, in fact, I believe, marks a most significant moment in Jesus' life. He comes to the Jordan to be baptised, and John the Baptist says he's unworthy to baptise, but nevertheless does baptise him. Does Jesus need the baptism for the forgiveness of sins? The answer certainly is no, he doesn't, because he, like Mary, is born without sin. He, like Mary, does not sin. Like everyone else, he has temptations, as we will see when we move into Lent, but he doesn't need the baptism as everyone else who went down to the Jordan to see John the Baptist needed it. So why did he go? He says, I've come along so that, that all things will be fulfilled. But is that all it is? Or is there something significant for Jesus? If you turn to the preface for today's Mass, which comes up afterwards, you will note that it, the church says, in the baptism, by entering the Jordan, all the waters on earth were blessed. And I don't know that that's what I celebrate on this day, because for me today is about Jesus. Um, very significantly, the next feasts which are about Jesus very strongly for me are the Transfiguration and the Passion, Death and Resurrection. <clears throat> They're about him. So what do we know about Jesus from it? It is what comes at the end of the baptism, those wonderful words, you are my beloved son, my favour rests on you. Why is this significant? Because these words, and they're the first time that we have words specifically spoken by the Father to Jesus Christ. We don't know whether there were any other ones, <clears throat> but... It's the only one we have. And if we take it that perhaps this may have been the first time that Jesus, in fact, heard the Father's voice, then this is one of the signal most important moments in his life. For 30 years, he's been going to the synagogue with Joseph because he was thought to be the son of Joseph. But Joseph knew that Jesus wasn't his son, and no doubt within the family, Jesus knew that Joseph wasn't his father. And perhaps there was talking in Nazareth. People were saying Mary was pregnant before they came to be with each other. So there would have been a slight question in the town of Nazareth, a small town in Israel at the time. What was spoken how was he greeted when they went to the synagogue? I suppose much like what would happen in any other small town anywhere else in the world, people are people. But on this event, <clears throat> when he comes out of the water, 
Jesus hears a voice. And I want you to imagine your Jesus with this kind of background. And the voice says, you are my beloved son. What does that mean for Jesus? He hears someone saying, I am your beloved father. Immediately Jesus is listening because whether this is the first time or not, it is the father speaking to him. And I can only imagine the joy that he must feel to hear this is my father speaking. And what does the father say? You are my beloved son. What does the word beloved mean? It means simply this. There is no one that I love more than you. You are my beloved. When you say to someone, you're my beloved, but there's someone around the corner you love more, you can't say to this person, you're my beloved. The word beloved carries with it that emphasis that you are the one that I love. And Jesus hears as he comes out of the water someone saying, you are my beloved, you are my son. And I often wonder whether Jesus wondered whether he would ever hear his father, whether he would see his father. So this is humanly one of the most significant moments in Jesus' life. But let's listen more carefully to what is said. You are my beloved son, my favour rests on you. My favour rests on you means this simply. Not only are you the one that I love more than anyone else, but there is nothing that you can do to make me love you more. You already have my favour. And therein is spoken the problem that happens in all father-son and mother-daughter relationships where a son thinks that he needs to prove himself to the father to gain the father's love, to gain the father's affirmation. And for a daughter, when the daughter feels that I must do or be a certain way to have my mother's approval, to have my mother's love. This, in fact, is an underlying instability in every child. You know, a child grows up often questioning Am I worthy of my parents' love? Do I have my parents' love? Because somewhere in growing up, a child experiences something of a rejection. And there is an implicit instability in our lives until we know that we are loved. And as Jesus comes out of the water, he is two things. I am your father, there is no one that I love more than you, and you need do nothing to earn my love. You have it. And this is the most important moment in Jesus' life to this point, because now Jesus knows who he is. He knows that he's loved. Identity is forged through the experience of perfect love. And when we don't have that, there's something missing in our lives. We strive for it. We try to do things to make ourselves lovable. We try to earn love. From this moment, Jesus will do nothing to earn love because he knows that he need do nothing. He can't do anything to earn more love. And we will see Jesus' life unfolding as his answer to the Father. The words are, you are my beloved son. You are my son. There is no one that I love more than you. There's nothing you need to do. And his answer to his father is, you are my father, my beloved, and there is no one that I love more than you. And the rest of his life will be a life which says that. And if we watch his life carefully, his life is a life lived saying to the Father, I love you. <clears throat> my life is proof of that. And I love you more than I love myself. Which is why this is the beginning of a movement which leads to his death. 
because I love you more than my own life. And so he willingly will give his life to his Father. And this all goes back to today's feast. You are my beloved Son, my favour rests on you. Let us all strive to know in ourselves the Father's love for us, that we are loved by God. Because when you know that you're loved by God, you can do anything. When you know that you're loved by God, you will have stability and surety of life. Because we are all called to be as Jesus is. The Australian Catholic Youth Festival is a gathering down here in Sydney where 19,000 Catholics from all over Australia have come here to strengthen their faith development. People come together to pray, worship and just come to hang out with friends or to meet new friends just to experience God on a whole new level. My experience so far at ACYF has been phenomenal, particularly yesterday when we had Sister Hilda lead all of us through La de Vigna. It was really empowering for me. It's really great, it just boosts the spirits to know that there's so many others with the same beliefs and wants and needs that you have for the Lord. I've had so much fun the last two days, it's been amazing. I've gone to so many different things. I went to my Lismore Bishop Diocese's talk and it was amazing. He captivated everyone, it was so good. For me, I just love the experience of everyone being together. It's got the greatest atmosphere, so I just enjoy all of the activities. But like when everyone's together and we're all contributing to the same thing, it's amazing. This year when I went on Sea Retreat, that opened a door for me to say, yes, I want to be a part of this journey. And that choice led me to coming here when I've been able to meet people who are on a similar faith journey, people who've only started this year or haven't started yet and they're just looking to start. Well, I've been able to meet up with a heap of friends that I've met in past Proclaim events like Shine and Street Retreat, traveling down, being in dorms with them. I've become close and we've been able to do all the activities and I've sort of shared my journey with them. It's been incredible, like 
there's friends that I met at Ignite and Shine that I have met up with from this diocese and like I just it's so many new people and new experiences and I like I've definitely come to a high in my faith whilst being here. I've grown a heap more through these programs and everything like this. They just became my family. Having them by my side each retreat just definitely helped a lot. You don't have to have a faith. You just come, enjoy it and open up and you'll get so much out of it if you just give to it. I'm a people watcher so I look at people and I see so much joy and happiness that they are experiencing while they're here and it's just incredible to watch.